So welcome to Case Studies, Effective Tribal Liaisons in Indian Country with Cassius Spears, Jr. and Pedro Torres. Uh, first, I would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, this session is uh, sponsored by Champions of Native Agriculture sponsors. And I would like to also add that IAC is launching a follow-up survey to the COVID-19 surveys from earlier this year. Um, when they're made available, please take, your, take the time to fill one of those out. We would really appreciate it. And first, I would like Cassius and um, Pedro to introduce themselves real quick before we get into the questions. Sure, I know. I'll, I'll go first, Pedro. Um, my name is Cassius Spears. I am a, um, a district conservationist in uh, the state of Rhode Island. I uh, work for NRCS. And I'm a member of the Narragansett Indian tribe, um, the only tribe, the only federally recognized tribe in Rhode Island. Um, I'm glad to be here and I thank you, thank you all for the opportunity to, to, to join you in today's uh, virtual event. Um, I look forward to today and the discussions that we have. All right, and Pedro? Uh, good morning, my name is Pedro Torres. Uh, thank you all for uh, allowing me to participate in this conference in this way. Um, very happy to help uh, spread some of the, you know, the, the successes we've had here in California. I am the tribal liaison for Natural Resources Conservation Service in Southern California. Um, uh, California has 110 federally recognized tribes and, and a couple dozen uh, tribes that are um, uh, that are uh, seeking to get uh, federal recognition. Um, and um, um, I uh, work, um, work with tribes in the southern part of the state. Uh, I'm also a small farmer. I have a small uh, organic olive uh, and an apple farm in Awanga, California. Um, Awanga is the Diageno Indian word and it means the, the place where the dogs are. All right, thank you for your introductions. So the first question is gonna be for Pedro. So can you explain what your day-to-day -day efforts look like in your position in California? Who do you work directly with and what NRC, NRCS programming are you engaging with? Um, sure, uh, so um, day-to-day, it, it, -day, it can vary a great deal. Um, you know, right now we're gearing up for a new program year, and so we're we're assessing last year's program and trying to attenuate things to make sure that you know it's it's still relevant to the uh, to the tribes, uh, and and making whatever changes we need for next year's program. You know, a few months ago we were looking at getting feedback on last year's program to see how it was going for folks. Um, in the next few months, I'll be working with field staff uh, and with tribes, you know, to do outreach. Uh, and as well as to help, you know, uh, work with the field staff to uh, on any of the nuances related to working with tribes. Um, now, then there's my kind of less regular stuff, you know, that I that I do. Uh, you know, I manage agreements uh, with uh, partners like Intertribal Agriculture Council. Uh, you know, things like making sure that they're getting paid for the work that they do, um, reviewing and submitting their uh, their financial and and uh, as, as well as their performance reports. And, and that's kind of the boring stuff. And the fun stuff is when I actually get to help, you know, do some of the work that's in these agreements, you know, things like holding workshops with tribes, holding training sessions for NRCS employees uh, so that they understand the, the complexities of, of working with tribes, you know, and, and then, you know, getting to work with tribal youth and with, with tribal interns that uh, participate in our programs. Um, and so I, you know, and I, I get to work with, uh, uh, engaged with a lot of different uh, folks, you know, the field staff, um, as well as the the area staff, and then and then the state office, uh, and then with tribes themselves. You know, it's a very iterative process. So the more feedback I can get from a lot of different places, you know, sometimes I think I'm a translator. You know, my job is to translate government speak to tribes, and sometimes it's to translate tribes' needs to our field offices. Um, I think that was. Did, did you ask me all three questions? I kind of got lost in the, in the, in the answer of the, the, the questions or. Um, uh, yeah, the final question would be, what NRCS programming are you engaging with? And then uh, what have been one or two of your greatest success stories that you feel demonstrate effective collaboration and resource management in your position? Right, thank you for the reminder, Padgley. Um, 
So uh, again, I, I mentioned the, the programs that I uh, engage with mostly and, and the folks that I engage with are the field staff, the state office, and of course the tribes. Um, I think one of our biggest successes this year uh, was you know, the success of our tribal equip program. Um, you know, we were able to engage tribes uh, and, and to in, get them participating in our programs to where we were uh, able to uh, obligate 170% uh, of the, uh, the the regular equip obligation, and so we we spent all the money we set aside for tribes. There was still some interest from from tribes out there, and we were able to find more funds uh, to obligate those contracts. and And that shows to me that our you know that our our work on developing this tribal specific program it's working. You know, it's 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 meeting the needs of tribes. It's uh, explaining. To our field staff, how to utilize these programs so that they can benefit tribes, and then you know getting those conversations happening, um, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, along with that, you know, I think a second great success really has been our work with Intertribal Agriculture Council to do these uh, workshops with tribes to uh, explain our programs, you know, and then at the same time uh, have a conduit for the tribes to explain their needs to our field staff, you know, and that process, again, with the help of IAC, uh, has helped get, you know, tribes to the table with NRCS employees, uh, you know, has helped us explain to them, you know, how we can work with them and has helped them explain to us uh, how we can work with them. And so it's, it's really helped create an, an iterative process, a real conversation in conservation. All right, thank you for answering those. And uh, Cassius, you'll be next. And we have the same question. So can you explain uh, what your day-to-day -day efforts look like in your position in Rhode Island? Um, who do you work directly with and what NRCS programming are you engaging with? Sure, 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 I, I, I will. Um, I'll try to hit all those. Um, so my, my position is uh, as a district conservationist is not uh, specific to any one group. Um, yeah, I, I serve the public in whole, uh, so private landowners, um, private landowners and uh, entities and organizations um, that um, want to um, access um, farm bill programs um, that is administrated by NRCS. So we, um, you know, I, I tend to work, you know, I guess the main part of my job, which I tell, try to explain to people, because when, when you say district conservation, this doesn't really... Um, I don't know, translate. But, uh, you know, basically what I am is, uh, you know, someone that develops relationships and builds relationships within, uh, within the community. Um, and a community that, it, that is um, the, actually the community that I work with is Providence County. So it's uh, actually the most diverse in Rhode Island. You know, I have urban areas, I have rural, rural uh, areas, I have um, diverse in, in all aspects of people and uh, race and economic status. So, you know, I work with all all different groups, and um, and the point would be to to um, to advocate for them in, in a sense to to help them access um, programs, these federal programs that are that are sometimes well, most of the time complicated. So, you know, what what. You know, me and Pedro do in, in in many ways is try to figure out how to make how to make these programs fit, and um, to meet our objectives and our mission as in NRCS and meet our conservation goals. Uh, at the same time, um, meet the individual goals of the of the producer. So you know, for tribes, uh, you know, I, I you know I work with tribal people that you know Narragansett people are. Um, our, our historic ter ter territory actually extends beyond um, our tribal land. So, you know, our Aboriginal lands are the whole state of Rhode Island. Um, so when I, when I work in Providence County, I work with indigenous people and um, I meet their goals when I'm, you know, as, a, as an indigenous producer. Um, and it, translating that into NRCS speak is kind of, I guess, my main function. Um, you know, you know, with IAC, um, with the Indian uh, indigenous people that participate as producers and farmers in this organization, they know the, um, and if they ever try to uh, use our programs, they know that there's, you know, sometimes there's terminology and language um, barriers. So, you know, I feel as a, 
a person that is uh, from those community from that community it's 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 easier i guess my main mission is to actually reduce those barriers make so that we're all speaking the same language um, that terminology is understood right from the beginning and and that way um, i empower the folks that i work with to be able to navigate these systems uh, so that they can use it for to meet their goals and objectives uh, so a success story, I guess, that would fall into that. Um, I'm always, uh, it's always hard for success stories because I look like with, you know, it's it's always good to, sh to highlight the the good moments. It's, you know, I look at relation, yeah, you know, I look at uh, working with clients and communities, especially communities that have a longstanding distrust for the government. I look at that more as a, um, um, you know, it's a relationship. You have to, you have to be a part of that. Uh, community that that people, uh, so you know it's uh, it's almost like a marriage. You know you have good you have good moments and bad moments, I guess. So, in, in the same time, I don't want to just share the success because there's also the lessons to be learned in the and when you don't have success and you, and and when when things don't work. Um, so, uh, from I guess what I'm saying is is that I can share a few success you know within within my county, but. You know, remember that you know this is just one side um, of that equation, and that there is, um, you know, there's times where we don't have understandings or program policy doesn't allow us to move forward, and and that's what where me and Pedro in many ways have to see if we can figure out how to accommodate, and because uh, there's a greater mission here, and that's you know feeding people and and helping people. Um, so. You know, some of the success stories I guess you have is that, you know, um, for, for me, we were able to work with uh, the elders in my community and help them establish a people's garden, uh, which was allowed to, which was uh, uh, important to them because they their meal site uh, tend, tended to have, um, their elders meals tended to have more processed foods. So the to give them an opportunity to have a location where they could have raised beds um, and, and uh, grow grow some foods, the old old foods that they grew up on, and and incorporate that into their meals. You know, it was something that was beyond just you know financial benefit or um, um, you know helping them solve a resource concern or, or something like that. It, it was actually uh, it was it was something that was emotional and built into their their history and who they are and what they are. So, you know, that's that's a success story that was meaningful. Um, and, and, that, and there's plenty more, um, but, you know, the key that I think is an interesting that I'm, the thing that I'm interested in, and if I'm gonna answer these questions like a politician and just answer what, <laughs> say what I wanna say, <laughs> but uh, the thing that I, I think I'm interested in is actually the tools, you know, and creating um, tools for, folks that are not uh, um, aware of how the NRCS programs are, USDA programs work, and so that they can understand how to navigate those places. Um, because I think success in a sense is relative, um, it's relative to the, to the people that you're working with and the communities that you're in. Something just like being able to sit down and have a conversation with a group that has long had distrust with um, federal agencies and you being able to break through and sit down and break bread with that community and those that leadership and and work out some issues is a big success in my mind. So it's not always um, you know project based or uh, you know how much you know conservation benefit is had or or funds that are being uh, expensed. Um, so there is um, I think there's an importance to think about it in that terms that it's a it's not um it's not kind of a um, climatic point that kind of ends it's it's not necessarily linear it's a kind of a cycle of of a relationship that we work with with our producers i think i answered the question i don't know but... yeah you did <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> all right Thank so our, our next question is kind of for both of you but if i'm a producer in indian country that is interested in getting started in equip contract what should I prepare for and who should I contact? You want to go ahead and put um, that one, Peter? Sure, sure. I, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, that 
like the, the first place to start with is, you know, your, your local field office. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be the boots on the ground assistance. Uh, they're going to be the folks you're going to be working with. Um, you know, it, it is also valuable, I think, to find out if your state has a tribal advisory committee. Um, you know, participating in those advisory committees uh, give you a voice in what the state is doing and their, uh, their resource concerns uh, for their programs. Um, and then uh, if, if, if they don't, uh, they are probably having local working group meetings. Uh, you know, that gives you an opportunity to, again, have a voice, but also hear what other folks are doing in, in your community. All right. Okay. How can IAC and other or other nonprofit or tribal organizations support NRCS's efforts in helping people help the land? Hmm, that's a good question. I, I think uh, I'll, I'll try to try to answer that one. Uh, so IAC is an important because uh, important aspect into the, into the, the whole system. Um, you know, we, we as NRCS as a federal, you know, entity can't, can't do it all. Um, there has to be partners, there has to be organizations that are um, doing the work that we can't do or going to the communities that we can't go into. Um, so that it bridges, it creates that that that, that pathway, so that um, you know, uh, so the goals can be accomplished for an, an individual or a tribe, or so you know, IAC is important because in many ways, um, you know, just the nature of, of government, you know, we can't we can't do and be everything be everything. So it to have these partners that can. Um, help with outreach or bring uh, uh, work with youth or um, um, work with uh, um, entities that were without that maybe aren't typically ones that would work with NRCS um, essentially create a uh, fill in those gaps um, and you know in the end yes you know the government has the funds so um, you know, the intends everyone comes back to us, but that's 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 okay. I've, yeah, I I would rather um, build a um, something something that is bigger than just one agency. That it's diverse and there's everybody doing a part for the bigger picture. You know, so um, I don't know if I answer that, but yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> okay, so those are kind of it for our questions, but we have a question from the conference attendees for Pedro. So what is the best way to get federal government employees to understand the needs and concerns of tribes? Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I think that's a very important part of my capacity as an NRCS employee is to kind of foster that, uh, that communication. And, and it really, you know, it, the, it, it, it boils down to having like a true communication and consultation process um, and, and, and having it at all levels, uh, you know, one, the quality of the communication, you know, it, I think, I think a typical government format is to, uh, is to be like, we're the government, we're here to help. Here's our list of programs. You know, what do you think? Uh, and I, and I don't feel like that really helps, um, in, in building, uh, a, a rapport building, uh, programs with tribes. You need to have a, uh, a, a dialogue with tribes. You know, like I, I mentioned the workshops we did we do earlier, we spend half the day focusing on NRCS programs, and then the other half of the day, you know, with the tribe communicating their needs and their resource concerns to our field staff. And so it, it becomes an iterative process. Um, but it has to happen not just at the field office level, it has to happen at the highest level of the organization. So that field staff has the, the support, you know, so that the, the, the people that are building the programs understand. And so you know, I, I, I think that's what it boils down to is really true communication and consultation, you know, at all uh, levels of, of, of uh, organization in, in your agency. All right. And then a question for both of you. Are there any NRCS offices working with tribal agricultural departments that are trying to encourage individual tribal farmers? So... Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. Pedro. Well, no, go ahead. I, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think there are yes. The, the 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 short answer is yes. I mean, NRCS offices all over the country, uh, kind of depending on how things are um, 
are set up with those individual tribes. You know, in, in California, uh, we've seen a lot more engagement with uh, tribal uh, councils, with tribal governments on kind of reservation wide projects. Um, but just this last year, we've seen a lot more engagement with individual tribal members. And I think in other parts of the country where there's more uh, tribal members that are uh, engaging in, in their individual agricultural um, uh, projects, their individual uh, agricultural enterprises, that they're doing more one-on-one uh, -on -one contracting with, with NRCS. Uh, Cassius, do you want to add to that at all? No, I think that was good, Pedro. Yeah, I, I would yeah, I would say the same thing. All right, we have a couple more questions. Pedro, I'm located in California. How can I join the Tribal Advisory Committee, committee meetings? Um, so email me and I'll make sure you are on our, our e emailing list. Um, we meet um, twice a year. Um, in the, the last couple of meetings have been done virtually. And I think at first we were a little worried about doing virtual uh, meetings, but we've had tremendous turnout, have been able to get you know really, really great feedback from folks. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if you're gonna post our contact information. It's, it's on my biography, isn't it? On, the, on, the, on my bio page. So um, you, have to, you have to tolerate reading about my former life as a motorcycle and bicycle mechanic to get to my contact information, but it's in there somewhere. All right. And then another one, I'm a tribal liaison in Idaho. One of our challenges is getting signatures on applications, contracts, plans, and payments. How do you deal with this challenge? Getting, getting signatures on applications. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think it's about building trust. I, I, I'm, I would imagine that someone's not willing to sign something is they don't have a trust in the an actual program or, or the, or the process. So, you know, perhaps, you know, you figure out other ways to provide technical assistance, I guess, um, until the pe people are confident that, okay, I see that there's, you know, that these are good people there. They have my best interest, you know, in heart and, and, uh, you know, I'm willing to, um, you know, I'm willing to go, go ahead and enter a contract with these folks. Um, I think it's just trust relationship building. Yeah, Cassius, and I just want to add to that. I think a, a little bit of patience and, and tenacity um, is, you know, is really helpful. You got to understand a, a lot of tribes have, you know, have bureaucratic systems in them a lot. Like, you know, our, our government has bureaucratic systems in it. And, and so, uh, you know, you might be working with their environmental department, but the signature has to come from the tribal chair. And so, you know, gentle reminders and 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 trying to get uh, you know the, the the paperwork to them with as much time as possible. You know, so that so that the the uh, the paperwork can work its way up the bureaucracy to where it needs to get signed. You know, I think those those things are really important as well. All right, thank you. And uh, what would be the first step you would recommend a government entity take to start to establish effective relationships with tribes? Oh, okay. And well, that's a, that's a deep question there, but, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, what, what areas that we have, um, uh, you know, as a government entity, I guess, um, if I was to speak for the entity, which is, which is dangerous, but I would say that, you know, they have effective relationships, you know, you need to first, you know, you know, understand understand the histories and truths in the relationships that um, have occurred to get us where we are today. Um, you know, that's kind of one of the main things. So I think as an agency, we need to, we need to be clearly understand, which in many ways we do, we, we provide trainings for our staff um, to give them historical context um, so that there is uh, kind of truth behind what, you know, our understanding and when we enter a community is the worst thing is not to understand that community, not understand their history, their struggles, um, their successes. So, you know, when, when I think that's the kind of the base, the base that we all need to kind of come to. And uh, once we can kind of figure that out, you know, I think we can start working on creating, you know, a relationship, um, 
you know, yeah, I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect, but um, building a relationship with a tribe is 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 hard. I mean, with any with any group, but another government, um, you know, it's gonna it's government to government, truly government to government relations. So we're gonna have our differences, and and it's important for us though, as a, a federal federal government, to to understand our role um, in in their history, and be it negative, be it, be it good or bad, you know. So um, I think that's the only way you start there, and you you have that that you have those conversations, um, and then you figure out um, how to move forward. Yeah, and the only thing I, I want to add to that is, you know, um, one, uh, listen a lot. Um, I, when, I, when I took the Working Effectively with American Indians course that I, I have had the privilege of, of, of uh, teaching with Cassius uh, uh, and, and some other liaisons around the country, I remember when I was a student in that course, uh, hearing the state conservationist for, for Washington, uh, Roylene, um, she comes at night now, she was rides at the door at the time, say, you know, we have we have two ears and only one mouth, and that's probably because we should listen twice as much as we speak. Um, you know, and, and, and I think a, a secondary component of that is just making yourself present in Indian country, you know, going to uh, their, um, uh, go, going to their Earth Day events, going to uh, powwows, um, you know, going to their public engagement events, um, you know, because that not only makes you visible, you know, uh, to the tribe, it, it also, you know, kind of gives you access to how they, they're communicating to, to people and to each other. All right. So there was kind of a revision to that question, but to start effective relationships with individuals, is, would you say those are the same kind of guidelines that you would go off for just not engaging with just the tribe, but also the individual members as well? Yeah, it's, it's very similar. Um, you know, you got to realize that just like, you know, you could make an argument that the the government, the federal government doesn't represent represent necessarily an individual in the same way, you know, there's diverse thoughts and positions and beliefs and, and, you know, just like in tribal communities, you know, they may, I mean, just like in a, um, you know, United States, you know, people don't necessarily trust the government or they do, or it's this, this range. So, um, yeah, your strategy needs to be, it needs to be changed. Um, you know, you, you approach them in, in a, in a, you may approach them in a different way. Um, you know, but, you know, for us as, uh, as federal employees, we, we work with tribal governments because we have a, you know, a, a you know, a fiduciary and a, a, a you know, a special relationship with, with, with tribes um, as sovereigns. So, you know, we, there's, there's a level of protocol that's embedded in how we, how we work with tribes and, and, and vice versa. Um, with the individual, um, it's, it's, it's different, but, but it's still, um, you know, based on relationship building, because even though, you know, you're working with a government, you know, they still have similarities in uh, understanding of history and relationship with with the government and relationship with the land. Um, all those things are embedded in the government and in the individual. So you still would have to approach them in a way where, um, you know, you have an understanding and you listen. And, that, and Pedro said that correctly is that you have to listen. You have to, you have to, you don't come in with, with strong ideas and positions, um, not, not in, definitely not in these communities. Um, you listen, and when you when you find out is when you listen, you actually find out that, um, especially with indigenous people, they know what they're talking about and they know the land um, better than better than anyone. I mean, they got, you know, you talk about communities that have over ten thousand years here on this on this on, on Turtle Island, so, you know. You know, a few hundred years that you know science has been present is not is nothing compared to that. So, you know, if you listen, you may learn something, and and I guess and you may develop a relationship that is that that will last for a long time. All right. So, our next question is: What are some ways you have built trust, especially in the beginning of a relationship? 
think we covered a, a bit of that. I'm not sure uh, how much more we could expand uh, expand on that. Um, cash is. Okay, I mean, I guess the easy one for working with a tribe. If, the best thing is I can't give you a. You know, there's no one size fits all approach. Unfortunately, every tribe's different. Every tribe has its own values. It has its own interest, its own goals and objectives. You know, so you. That's why the key is in listening, because you might. You know, be listening, and something might, you know, you might hear something. You're like, oh, that's something we could help with. You know, I, that's that's usually you find that in, um, you know, for an example. You know, there are some tribes in the Northeast. I know there's some other tribes too, but you know, we we had an opportunity using the plant materials center to provide them with some plants that they that they deemed culturally significant or or um, or declining in their area. So the fact that we have these plant material centers that we can propagate and, and grow some of these these plants and bring them back to them and say, hey, you go, you know, that was something that they, again, it's a small, it's a very small gesture, but it's something that, you know, opens the door um, for maybe bigger projects later on. Um, you know, you know, for my tribe, they, you know, they were in a process of designing, um, or putting in a, um, a burial ground and, you know, you know, our agency offered to help them with, with, with drawings and to be able to have a, um, um, someone sketch out and design, design, design the site in the way that they, that they would, they, they, they wanted. So, you know, little things, you know, we, we, sometimes they have a issue and you just try to find out if you can help them. Um, just be there and be available and listen. And, and if you do those small things enough, then they'll come to you when they have big problems. Um, and, and then that's when you can really help them. Yeah, that's great, Cassius. And, and as usual, Cassius starts to speak and it, 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 it triggers a bunch of synapses in my brain. And I remember things too. Is, you know, another good component is uh, you know, sharing success stories um, that you've had with other tribes, uh, I think, and we've been told by our tribal advisory committee that that's more meaningful to them than success stories that we maybe have done work with with non-tribal members. Um, I, I always preface this uh, by saying, you know, if you're, you're, you're going to do that, make sure you've got the permission of the tribe to share their success stories. Um, you know, and especially if your success stories are going to be multi-graphical and you're going to put, you know, colorful things on them, you know, make sure you have permission from the source tribe before you use something like a, a basket design or something like that. Um, you know, you don't want to put something on, on your advertisement for your agency uh, that might be sacred to a tribe and, and, uh, and not have their permission to be using that. Um, so I say, you know, use use success stories with tribes, but make sure you've got the, um, you know, the kind of the backing for the tribe to do, from the tribe to do that. Um, I was at the Intertribal Agriculture Council's annual meeting last year, and we had our, our Native American Heritage Month poster, which you can see if you visit the NRCS exhibit, um, virtual exhibit in the a virtual exhibit hall. Uh, and it, it had a, you know, it's a gorgeous poster. It was made using art from a, a Native American artist and, and a woman saw it on my table and wanted to know why you know, I had their tribe's sacred symbols on a poster, you know. And when I explained to her that this was done through a contest, it was an artist from the tribe that had submitted, she, she was grateful, she was happy. But at first she felt, you know, what, what was I doing representing, you know, her tribe's culture in this way, um, once she knew that it had been part of, a, of a, an engagement and a commitment with the, the, the tribal artist, uh, she was very happy to hear that. All right, and our next question is, do your NRCS offices collaborate with university extension systems to do tribal ag outreach? So, so mine does. In, in California, we've got a pretty good relationship with uh, University of California Extension. Um, when the last time we held the Working Effectively with American Indians training, we actually had five University of California Extensions, uh, Extension Service staff attend our Working Effectively with American Indians trainings. Um, and we did one of these workshops that I mentioned earlier um, at the Plant Materials Center uh, in Lockford. And, and we had a handful of UC Extension folks attend there as well. Um, and, and I have been asked to participate in some of their trainings you know, for, for doing outreach. Um, and then, yeah, because I have their email addresses and, 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 and know the personnel, if a, if a tribe's interested in doing something and it's just not exactly NRCS's cup of tea. It's just, it's, it's like starting a new agricultural enterprise uh, or, or that kind of expertise. 
uh, I can direct the tribe to the UC Extension folks. Um, I don't know to what extent that's being done uh, around the country. Yeah, you know, if, you know, we we don't have a strong extension, um, you know, um, it, it, from the university here in 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 Rhode Island. But um, you know, when there is opportunities to work together, we do take it. Um, but I, you know, it's something that should be done everywhere. If you have if you have an extension service, it should be, we should make effort to work with them because they, they have requirements also to, um, you know, work with these, work with tribal communities, um, especially land grant institutions. So, you know, where we can, we should definitely encourage them to and, and partner with them. All right. And our next question is, uh, what are some best practices you've seen in federal grants or other grant-making organizations that are particularly responsive to the needs of Indian country? Hmm. What other grants? Uh, well, well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different organizations that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm expert in. <laughs> you tend to be, when you work for NRCS, tend to be NRCS centric, but, but yeah, we do, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, um, you know, if there's, you know, we get other grants and opportunities, we want to make sure those go out. So I, I tend to send a lot of stuff out to, um, 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 my partners and, and to tribal, tribal folks. So, I mean, there's the Sayers grant. I mean, there's, uh, First Nations Development Institute. Um, there's the, uh, um, shoot, now I'm probably blanking. Do you know any others, uh, Pedro? There's the one that just came out with the coalition. Uh, um, um, a bunch of grants that came out uh, related to Keith Siegel. Um, yeah. You know, there's uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has the Tribal Wildlife Grant, um, as well as yep. uh, Tribal Partners for Fish and Wildlife. You know, I, I, I mean, I think at the heart of the question is that the, the best practice is if you're going to try and develop a grant is, 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 you know, get feedback on how the grant should be developed from the tribes you want to serve, uh, you know, yeah. make tribal specific programs, you know, again, that, that's been the, the huge success in, in equip, uh, in tribal equip in California, which is not a grant per se, uh, but it is a, a, a program that has financial assistance and technical assistance tied to it. Um, it's been as successful as it is because we built it in communication with the tribes. And every year we get feedback on how it's working and we attenuate it appropriately to make sure that it's still relevant to the tribe. Yeah. All right. So do you ever find it difficult to toe the lines of adhering to federal parameters while also supporting and advancing tribal interests? If so, how do you overcome this barrier? How do you show up as being authentic and fully transparent? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, you do. I would say, yeah, you do get into a, a situation sometimes where you want to uphold tribal interest, um, but you have policy that you have to follow. You know, I don't think there's, there's never been a time where the where the tribe blames me per se, um, you know, because policy is, I mean, these things are set in, set by Congress. So, you know, it's the farm bill. So we do, we, um, we do our best um, to to make sure their interests are understood. Most of the times that we get, I get into some sort of um, disagreement though, I've, I've been, especially when it's in areas of conservation, you know, I've, I feel like there's always ways that we can, we can relook at things and figure out how to make it work. Um, I mean, the good thing about our agency, you know, NRCS is it's, found, it's full of problem solvers. I mean, that's kind of our, you know, that's, that's, that's what we pride ourselves off of is where those that go out and get things done. A lot of people talk about it, but we go get it done. So, you know, we pride ourselves in our ability to, to take on challenges and find solutions. Um, so if, if, if the tribe's there with us and they, they, they want to work through these things, you know, we, you know, if you give us some time and be patient, we'll, we'll figure out a way to, to go at it, you know, and, and get it done. Um, it may take some time, but, will eventually get there. And, and if not, there is ways, you know, not to get into too many de details, but there is ways for us to, you know, especially if it's a question of um, ecological, traditional or indigenous ecological knowledge or, um, 
you know, any kind of uh, questions around that or cultural importance or, um, you know, of history or anything like that, we can, you know, we can definitely invoke some, uh, you know, some authorities and, and look into doing some policy, policy changes or adaptions or, or any kind of those uh, methods to kind of get the job done. Um, one of the advantages as a tribe, if you're applying as a tribe, is that, you know, you know, you have a, um, you have a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, wiggle room there because of the, of a, again, the special relationship the government has with, with uh, government to government relations. So, you know, we can look at those and look at our policy and it generally most, most of our policy is, is, is flexible um, dealing with, with tribes, um, but yeah. Yeah, I concur with everything that that Cash has said, and and can only add, you know, um, uh, and and again, I guess I'm, you know, talking more to the to the government uh, employees that might be is, you know, if you run into a barrier, you need to take a look back at at your your policy and 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 you know is and 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 determine is it really a barrier? You know, just because something hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and actually, one of you know in NRCS, one of the words in our policy is removing barriers. For tribes to participate in our programs, and yeah. and and fortunately, NRCS is malleable enough, and and you know, especially with my experience in California, our our state leadership has been committed to to keeping our programs malleable enough, you know, to to to, to really get to the root and removing those barriers. And then, as far as being you know authentic and fully transparent, I think it comes down to being authentic and fully transparent, and 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 saying you know this is where I can flex. You know, this is where I can't flex, and 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 have that communication. You know, um, you know, and 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 really explore the discussion because sometimes the root of the problem has more to do with people saying the the same words but not necessarily having the same meaning from them, uh, and 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 you can get get through a lot of barriers just by making sure that the communication is uh, is thorough. All right, well thank said. you. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in yet. Is there anything else that you know you would want to add that we didn't touch today? You know, um, to the to the to the to the tribes that are out there that are are are, are looking into you know what NRCS does. You know, I, I I say explore to what extent you can be engaged with you know the NRCS process. Again, it is if is there a local tribal advisory committee? If if not, or sorry, a state tribal advisory committee. If not, is there a regional tribal advisory committee? Um, and if those entities don't exist, um, it's worth finding out why. Um, you know, uh, I I know some states. The, uh, uh, the the tribes haven't been interested in communicating on that level. Felt like they wanted more of a one-on-one -on -one access to the state conservationists, and that's understandable. Um, but uh, also, you know, making sure you're aware of when local working groups. You know, these these are NRCS is founded in getting the the information from the field level up to the national level to form our programs. And, and the more you can engage with that local field level process, the more the needs of your tribes can be met by NRCS. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll say something similar in, in, in that, you know, there's a lot of potential and opportunity here. Um, that's, and especially on our end, there's a lot of um, participants or are, are, are folks that I feel like within tribes and, and tribes themselves or and individuals, uh, members of tribes, that really should get a, to really should learn about USDA programs and NRCS in particular. Um, you know, I, I found that there's, especially in, in my region, there's not a lot of uh, knowledge of what these programs can do, and and they usually count themselves out, like they feel as as if what they're doing, um, which tends to be pretty intensive many times and pretty well developed like um, you know growing traditional medicines in their in their in their at their homestead you know being subsistence growers and feeding you know growing food on their on their property that they they use in 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 process of canning and and storage of their own food I mean they wouldn't even think to come into the office and 
ask about programs. And, and I've, I've found that many times. I said, and in, in a lot of it's my own, you know, in my own areas, my own family, I'm like, hey, you know, you know, you, you know, you're, you're, you're an agriculture producer. And they're like, what? No, no. You know, so it's, it's, you know, there, there is, I think there's a barrier that I need to, we need to get through with individual in, um, tribal members because um, typically the and for tribes too because the the way that USDA and way we we uh, administer funds is different than how they relate with other government agencies um, and it's it's different so it's because it's different they may not they, they may not uh, look at look to these these funds um, but if they can figure out how and understand how the funding mechanism works is it's not necessarily it's you know we call it grant but it's not necessarily a grant um you know you know they can figure out how to incorporate these into their into the how they work and how they uh conduct conservation and and manage land um i think there's a lot of opportunity there that's not being tapped into by tribal organizations and if individual tribal members if they realize that they don't have to go to their tribe necessarily because most of the programs that are administered by tribes the tribal member goes to the tribe to seek in this case it's you go directly to agency so that's a different that tribal members don't understand they 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 think that um, all programs are trying to, are directed through their tribes. So if they understood that, yeah, you can go to these, this USDA is one that serves individuals and you can come here and you can sign up for these programs. I, I think that there would be a lot more folks um, that would take advantage of it. So that's a, that's a, that's something that, you know, I, me, you know, me, my, myself, I try to figure out how to, how to, how to reach folks um, that are not what they, you know, typical or traditional farmers that that are more small scale and and um and and they don't know that these programs are available to them. I think that's uh, one of the biggest um, uh, barriers uh, within our programs. But you know, we every year we're getting more and more and more. Like Pedro said in the beginning, that that we're getting more individuals signing up. So that shows that there's some success that we're figuring out how to reach them and. And organizations like IAC are helping us do that, um, teaching kids. Um, I know the IAC has a great youth program that, you know, th th these kids know more about the farm bill than than sh most folks. So um, they they go ahead and they are the the growers and producers of the future, and they are tribal leaders of the future. So those those it's going to come to a point where we're gonna start seeing more engagement, especially with movements of food sovereignty movements and uh, food security movements. Ish, you know, it's, it's, it's more present now in people's lives. So I think, you know, NRCS is set in a position that can be really helpful um, if we just need to create that, that knowledge. And like I said, that terminology in the beginning so that they understand the terminology so they know what to ask for and how to ask for it um, and how to, navigate this system so thank you all right thank you Pedro. Actually, I, I do got one more thing to say you know okay. i mentioned the virtual exhibit hall um we've and if you hit that virtual meeting button you can actually talk with an nrcs person during the exhibit hours we've we've kept our exhibit our booth staffed uh during exhibit hour uh uh during exhibit hall uh, hours um, and no one's come by. I think people are afraid to hit that virtual meeting button. Um, but one of the things I love about this, uh, you know, this conference every year is is getting to talk to tribes from around the country and hear what y'all are doing. And I've really enjoyed connecting with my uh, NRCS counterparts that are at the booth with me, virtually speaking. Um, but I'd really like to talk to some of you all. So uh, if you're perusing the exhibit hall, stop by the NRCS booth and don't be afraid to hit that virtual meeting button. All right, thank you. Well, yeah, just a reminder, we do have a virtual trade show. <laughs> Go and check it out and check out our sponsorship page. But I wanna thank you, Pedro and Cassius for joining me today and you know, answering our questions and sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. <laughs> thank All you. All right, well. Cassius, it's a pleasure to present with you again. Oh yes, thank you, Pedro, you, you as well. <laughs> All right.